Are there any man my managers in the crowd? Did you hear that? Uh, I'm proud to introduce uh, Mr. Hal McConnell. I, he was a little concerned about giving this talk today, so he went out and gave a dry run. And he, he hit a good, sophisticated crowd, and it went over well. The fifth graders appreciated it, and he feels he will make it fly for this crowd. Um, Hal is a volunteer consultant for the Washington Baltimore Narcotics Association. Okay, no one's leaving. Good. He's a retired NSA researcher, teacher, and he is currently working at the National Cryptologic Museum as a docent. I've never heard the term. He's not sure what it means either, but if you come to the uh, museum, he will give you a guided tour. Uh, we're going to have two parts to the talk today. The, the formal talk will be about cyber terrorism. After lunch, after the talk is over, he's, he's going to talk about one of the toys that I brought, an original enigma from the Germans. Uh, I'm not sure what I should say, Indiana Hal, or here's Hal. Storyteller Hal. Hello, it's magic time, yes. Um, I'm going to start with something a little different, not the terrorist. I don't want to frighten you yet. I want you to have your, uh, you know, your dessert at least before you start getting a nervous stomach. I love what Richard did yesterday, talking about what I call virtual countries, entities that have people's adherence that are beyond what we consider national borders and actually cross over three or four continents. And the organized crime cartels do that. But before they came into being, we had this thing called the United States of America. And I'm, I'm a historian. And I've done a lot of re research in history, including Revolutionary War, and I was astonished at, particularly with our Spanish adherents, how many of those who fought for the Revolutionary War were contingents from places like Haiti, Dominican Republic, Cuba, and with a gentleman by, by the name of Bernardo de Galvez, won all of the southern tier of what is now the United States from the Mississippi to Florida for the revolution. Venezuelans, Cubans, a uh, free black contingent, a bunch of half Spanish Irishmen. You know, what a story. We forget that the United States of America is not a tribe, it's not a clan, it's not a nation state made up of a homogeneous group of people. We adhere to something else, a living ideal of liberty a living ideal of government that is democratic and representative. And we know what people are like and how corrupt they can be, so we split it in three parts so each part could watch the other. And if you can't get justice from the executive, you try the Congress, and then you can sue them in court. What did it cost us to come up with this new entity beyond ethnic boundaries? There's a movie out now called The Patriot, right? And it kind of smushes history together, but it does take it from a family in Carolina and the terrible suffering they had to go through, and many did, to win the freedom. I think it's a must-see. It has enough history in it to remind us of how we got here and what it cost. My first slide it's going to be something very unique related to this. The first, this is from the National Archives, very few people have seen this. The first big naval battle in our history before we were a country, we were just a rebellious province of England, had to do with the probably the most crucial battle and the winning of it. What battle was that? After that battle, the war was pretty much over for independence. What is that? Yorktown. Yorktown. Thank you very much. And one of the reasons the French were able to beat the English on the high seas for once 
during that period was because of what we now call signals intelligence. James Lovell, Committee of Secret Correspondence for the Continental Congress, made codes and ciphers and broke them. And the English only had a few that they could use and they kept reusing them. And Lovell had broken the cipher, which you see up there on the screen, prior to the Battle of Yorktown by many months. The dispatches were either captured, intercepted in those days, you hit the guy over the head or you bought him off, or you found his dead body and picked up the dispatches. A little different than what we have today, picking up information by taking it off the internet or the air. Nonetheless, you see some of these critical dispatches. The first one has somebody whose name in it right near the top you're all familiar with, right? What is it? You have to look hard. Right up near the top, there's a name of a general that was a famous American general who helped him win the Battle of Saratoga, and then, uh-oh, he defected. Arnold! Albemarle Sound, look at that message. Poor old Arnold was down there in the Virginia Capes. He almost got trapped by one of the French naval operations there. It wasn't very successful down there. Very near Yorktown with Cornwallis. Now let's look at the next slide because this is the critical one. This is the strategic decrypt. There are other parts of it, but I wanted you to see it. Read it. What does it say? Can you catch it? Let me hear it. What do you see? Ned Watson, keep reading. Okay, detachment. 100 men are now in Georgetown. 100 men now in Georgetown. Convoy coming from Ireland. Now this has a time on it, we don't see that time, but it is many, many months for this convoy forming up in Ireland that is going to be bringing reinforcements, very badly needed food, medicine, a shot, shell, and powder down to Cornwallis, who in other messages has talked about his dire straits. He can't hang on for very long. Because this is slow-mo warfare, this gave the Continental Congress and Washington time enough to pass the message down to de Grasse, the French commander in the West Indies, and he was able to assemble from scattered detachments the fleet and get them in a place called the Chesapeake Bay in large enough numbers that when the convoy finally meandered across the Atlantic and came down from New York it ran into a force that was twice as large as it was. Cornwallis did not get what he needed to survive. Therefore, he lost the Battle of Yorktown. Unfortunately, the French didn't do very well without continuous signals intelligence cryptographic support because de Grasse went back to the West Indies and the crusty old British Admiral Rodney caught him a couple of years later and crossed his T, as they say, and raked one ship after the other and killed de Grasse. But he had one glorious hour and it was done to some extent because they had enough full warning by breaking the cipher that the British used. This is before the great battle of Midway, one of the greatest battles won, partly through cryptography giving us forewarning. So I thought you'd like to see that. Something unique. Not very many people have seen it from the archives. Want to hit the next one? If you come to the NSA Museum, you will also see this object. It was called the Jeffersonian cipher. It has 45 couple of missing mixed alphabets, randomized alphabets. The French didn't admit that they invented this till 1840, a man named Beziers. However, 
this was found in somebody's attic in West Virginia and they put it in a yard sale flea market. Fortunately, one of our people picked it up for like 25 bucks. It's probably worth a lot more, probably around a million, because there is no other example of it on the planet that we know of. And the metallurgy in the wood told us in analysis that Gee, it wasn't 1840, it was around somewhere around 1789 to 1800, when French agents were over here trying to get us into their Revolutionary War. And I can surmise that the agent probably found out that it wasn't working very well, some of his friends have been guillotined by their friends, and he thought, hmm, it's pretty nice over here, and she is lovely. So he married her, didn't tell her about this, and it stuck it up in the attic, and it came out in 1983. <laughs> Check your attics. Now we'll go into paranoia. You want to hit the next slide? Russian organized crime. I don't want to pick on the Russians and say, like, uh oh, this guy's going to give us ethnic slurs. Oh, you know, I don't like anybody, so don't feel bad. The, uh, <laughs> Terrorism, organized crime, I'll start with the Irish because that's my background. In 1991, thereabouts, late 80, uh, 1990, there was a raid in New York by the U.S. Marshals called Operation Valhalla. And they broke into the room where the IRA was. We all know what they did for a living and are still doing, perhaps, well, maybe not. That's very questionable. They found the drugs, the cocaine, and the money on the table and also a radio that was listening to the marshal's frequency, which fortunately was using DES. What was the cocaine for? What was the money for? To purchase what? Arms, right, explosives to advance the cause in Northern Ireland. Terrorists, drugs, money, a great theme. Back in 1988, in Defense Review, a NATO publication, they had a very interesting article based on reports from the FBI, CIA, and General Senja, S-E-N-J-A, who was a defector from the Czech Intelligence Service. Uh, he was in their high command in the Army, and he went to a meeting with Khrushchev in 1962. Khrushchev was a little angry with Kennedy, who had humiliated him, and Khrushchev had a new approach to humiliating and destroying American culture. He was telling the array of intelligence services there from all over Eastern Europe that he had received the reports from the Chinese of the autopsies on American corpses after the Korean War. The Chinese had used opium against our troops to lower morale and capability. And after it was over, they took some of the bodies and autopsied them and found 20% of the 18 to 20 year olds had many heart attacks. Kind of young to be having many heart attacks. And they concluded that the opium use with the troops was a significant weapon. Khrushchev said, this is great. We can uh, sell something to the capitalists that uh, will be used to hang them. And he called Raul Castro up and he said, you're going to help us be the point man with the Colombians in South America. You were going to help facilitate the movement of massive quantities of cocaine into the United States. And it'll help your economy, and you'll be able to use the money to buy guns to support Latin American revolution. The revolutionary supported included not only the ones we're familiar with in Central America, but some folks we're having a little trouble with today that are better armed and equipped than the Colombian army. Who are they? F-A-R-C-E-O-N, both of whom were supplied during that time and by the Russian Mafia continued to be supplied to this day. Now they're doing it for fun and profit. They originally did it for terrorism and to destroy the fabric of the country. But they set up the channels. Eastern European intelligence, communist uh, revolutionaries, drug dealers, growers, back in the 60s. So when everything collapsed, folks were out of a job. Eastern European intelligence people, um, various government employees, KGB. So they said, hey, 
we might as well go and be in business with these people and make money. Same, some of the same people involved in the business today. The connections were there, the networks were there, and they were worldwide. That gives you kind of a frame to put what I'm going to talk about in Russian organized crime. I'm going to slip over to the Chinese for the moment because they're all in this together, as we say, Chinese organized crime. Uh, a friend, uh, rather, I'm sorry, a reporter named Frank Viviano, who was in the San Francisco Chronicle, took a trip just a couple of years ago to Fuzhou City and um, the, the Salerno of China kind of thing. And he took the tour. I'm surprised he's still alive because he's interviewing all these people about who runs the town. The gentleman that runs the town was the head of the Sun Yian Triad. He had the 20-story building, and he was an open supporter of Tiananmen Square. So he said, what? This man should be dead. Why is he not dead? And the guide said, look over there, and you'll see Mercedes, Ferraris, you know, Beamers. He said, yeah, I see those beautiful cars. My god, they're expensive. Um, well, you didn't answer my question. He said, well, in a way I did, because those belong to the party officials, and you will see that the driving wheel is on the wrong side. It's in the English side, and that's forbidden in China, but nobody's going to arrest the heads of the party. And he says, let me tell you how thoroughly this guy runs things. You see the billboard over there? Yeah. What's it say? It says, direct flights to San Francisco and Las Vegas, American dollars only. They're here and having a wonderful time. The Chinese, as you know, came in as immigrants, and like most of us who came in here, they had a rough time with the locals, and they had fraternal organizations, and they had organizations to protect them, and these were the Tongs. Now, of course, they also did some smuggling, as the IRA did, and so on and so forth. Everybody has that kind of association. Some of these tongs became more criminalized and in the 70s and 80s got more involved in the heroin market especially. The Watching is one of the largest of these criminal organizations in Los Angeles and in San Francisco. As we move into the 90s, even though they had associations with the triads of 14K, uh, the big circle boys, Sun Yeon, it was the Wohop Toe Triad from Hong Kong that came over and took them over. And, and they had about four or five hundred people that extended in their operations with drugs into Canada, Vancouver, Toronto, and then down into New York City. In New York City, you have the On Leon, uh, Tong, and the Ghost Shadows, which is several hundred people. They're enforcers. They collect debts and they shoot people, and you know, and they're involved in the drug business with another cartel, the Dominicans of which there are 700,000 in New York City, like a, a whole city within a city. Um, the reason I bring the Dominicans up is another triad, the Kun Lok, who are also involved in the drug business and smuggling of aliens and so on, and guns, uh, work with the Dominicans. And when the police in New York were getting a little too close and the FBI, some of the Kun Lok guys went down to the Dominican Republic and paid the $35,000 and became citizens. So they're not only in the drug business with them, but they're citizens of the Dominican Republic, and they do money laundering for them in the Dominican Republic. The reason I bring up the Dominicans and kind of fold them into the story is because when they went after the Dominican cartel, they were money laundering through remittances so much that Congress had to pass another bill to tighten up on how much money you could send because they was, you know, in the $500 million categories. And... Uh, as the investigation of the Dominican crime cartel proceeded, and you can read this on some of the analysis uh, from the uh, New York websites, they found that some of the money that had been laundered through coupons uh, in the many thousands of grocery stores uh, as part of their money laundering uh, operation had gone to the low end of the World Trade Center bombers. Now, why would they provide money to terrorists? Well, let's see who is behind the Dominican cartel. People who have been caught with drugs on them. Representatives of the Democratic Revolutionary Party of Dominican Republic. What's their lineage? Oh, they were 
dedicated Castro-right party that was violently American. So they're in it for the money, but hey, if you can cooperate with some people that want to do a little terrorism, then we're going to do it. And you see this cooperation all around the world. Russian organized crime, let's take a look at that. And uh, we'll just leave that up there for the moment. Back in the 70s, the KGB, of course, keeps track of everything, including what's going on in Russia, um, through the Cheka type organization, said, hey, this is all coming apart, boys. The economy's collapsing, and hey, we don't want to get down with it. They had just recently infiltrated the Russian mafia, which was kind of scattered, not as powerful as it is today. And they had trained some of these mafiosa because the GRU, their rivals in the intelligence business in the army, had some of them working for them and they didn't want to be outdone. So they had a cadre of these mafia leaders that were well trained and associated with the KGB. They talked to certain members of the ruling class, the nomenclatura of Russia, and they decided they would offload as much money and valuables as they could. The KGB had a lot of banks they had set up in businesses overseas all over the world. So it was a nice vehicle. Six hundred billion dollars were gradually pulled out of the Soviet Union and of course it collapsed. But with them owning anywhere from 40 to 60 percent of the banks, when privatization came, who had the money to buy the particular enterprises? We know, right? So that's why we have the kleptocracy in Russia today that Mr. Putin is trying to fight against, at least some of them. Berezovsky, a multi-mega billionaire, and so on and so forth. And we had a version of the Muriel boat lift. In the 70s, as this was happening, they opened up their prisons and sent some of their most talented people here. And if you read Robert Friedman's book, which I heartily recommend, which reads like a novel and has sourcing that you won't believe, CIA, FBI, DEA, New York police, and the criminals he interviews himself, and he has $100,000 on his head, contract killing, you will be fascinated by these characters. You had a series of these mafiosa come over, and the ruling cadre is called the Bratsky Klug, Krug, and these are Dons. They call them the Vori, and they are the Vor, the Zakon, the thieves in law. They fight their way up the food chain, kill people, pull off scams, and have tattoos that say they're at the top of the ladder, and they run from a council and assign different chunks of Russia and parts of the world to an influence to these dons. The first one that came over was Evsey Argon, a vicious person, did a lot of intimidation and killing. He really didn't have style. He was followed by Munya Elson, who was another killer. Didn't have his, he wasn't quite as vicious as the first one, but everybody in Brighton Beach in the area where they moved in with their relatives, and of course many of them were not anybody's relatives, uh, you can't get somebody arrested for killing people in that area because it's too dangerous. The next person that comes along is Vyacheslav Ivankov, and he's been in the newspapers. And to give you an idea of how powerful and deadly this guy is, Ivankov in 1978 was in prison. Many of the Dons, like the Colombians, run their out operations from prison. He arranged for blowing up a place called Sverdlovsk in the bioweapons facility. Killed a thousand people with anthrax. Frank Ducks, the guy that was in Bloodsport, was a super agent for CIA, was actually working with the KGB to find where this guy was because he was pretending to sell a super biological weapon, probably to our Mideastern terrorists. But after a couple of years of running around the world trying to catch this guy, the Alpha team member of the KGB who worked with Frank said, Listen, I found out there is no bioweapon. It's another one of these super scams by the Russian mafia. They, they, they do things, $500 billion, $7 billion scams. There was no bioweapon. But Will Vyacheslav probably sold a bunch of Petri dishes for half a billion to several customers. When the Chechens almost took over 
Russian organized crime, they had to bring somebody in to kill them fast and big, and they brought Vyacheslav in. The car bombs, pipe bombs, dead people all over Moscow got everybody so upset that the Bratsky crew said, go to New York and uh, be our representative in the New World. And so he was. He and uh, his predecessor, a man named, get this, Marat Balagula, sounds like Dracula, were noted for not only excursions and money laundering scams, but also fuel fraud, $8 billion worth of fuel fraud. Wonderful. Not only in New York and the East Coast, but with their representatives in San Francisco and Los Angeles. They finally got good old Vyacheslav as he was trying to extort some Russian bankers for a $3 million pocket change and threw him in jail. Marat Balagula was involved in something else, something we're all very concerned about. What is happening? What went wrong in Sierra Leone? Mar Marat Balagula, when he was still in New York, had some operations in Sierra Leone. His point man was a man named Kalmanovich, who should have been a Mossad agent but was actually a KGB agent. He and a contingent of ex-Israeli commandos provided the Praetorian Guard for the new uh, president of Sierra Leone and armed them for what in return, what's in Sierra Leone that they wanted. Tons of diamonds. The Russians at the moment are sponsoring illegal aliens into the Baltimore, Washington area from Sierra Leone and um, eastern, um, east coast of uh, Guinea, which is also involved in this, so they can increase their heroin supply. Impressive people, very violent. As Gotti said, we're bad, we'll kill you, but the Russians are worse, they'll kill your whole family. The most dangerous man in the world, and this has been in testimony given before the Congress by the Center for Strategic and International Studies, a wonderful group, very competent. They have uh, books out, bound copies of their testimony research. Webster, former C uh, and a FBI director, uh, Arnold Borgrav, the guy that wrote the Spike, been involved with intelligence and newspaper work for many years, a guy named Colorflow. The most dangerous man in the world, you will find in their work and also Robert Friedman's work. His name is Simeon Miguelovich. He's got a PhD. In economics, he surrounds himself with people that have a master's degree. They're very well connected, ex-KGP, military. His organization, uh, which at one time was in Hungary, had advanced signals intelligence capability, encryption capability. Hey, when they're on the internet, they have, uh, you know, the network and so on and so forth. Four or five continent-wide organization. Yes, the most dangerous, and you never get to him because he's three or four layers deep. The Israelis don't want him, but he's got an Israeli visa and passport and he just goes there anytime he wants to. And we didn't want him here to visit Vyacheslav in the, in the prison up in New York, but he came in on his Israeli passport, had a nice little chat and visit and left. How does this affect us sitting right here? Let's turn to the next slide. Let's see. This was a six nation investment money laundering scam. It's magnificent. We started out a fee for service scam in Moscow. Give me $4 million and I'll deliver this and that. And he never did. Put the money in an offshore account in the Channel Islands, Chaborini Island, Aber Shabby Island, I can't remember. And then he did the same thing in Kiev. You see Arbet there was the, uh, one of the first organizations and what's it, Peregrine, I can't read it from here, I can't remember it. Those were the organizations he set up in Moscow, Kiev, 
Then he moved into Hungary, Magnex, Aragon. You see how he did it? Offshore accounts. He bought up a small magnet company. He knew people were hot for super magnets, which are used in advanced nuclear research. It's cobalt Sumerian magnets at the time. Maybe they sold five. He reported several thousand. He bought up the arms industry in Hungary, which became part of this conglomerate, and sold weapons from Eastern Europe to our most dangerous adversaries, Iraq, Iran, Syria, Libya, and bought an air, air uh, company with uh, large jets to fly both weapons and drugs to his clients. This guy was big. As you see, he moved into Canada. Uh, the Canadians were fascinated by this operation of YBN Magnex and practiced the, uh, the predecessor. They started investing. It got bigger and bigger. Even though it was investigated and there were some questions about it, the Canadians kept pumping along. While this was going on, British intelligence and criminal investigators had found that YBM Magnex was largely a scam. I love the way they stuck their finger in the British eye with companies that were insulting. Look at the name of those British companies. One of them is called C-R-E-A-T-E-B-U-R-Y, Create and Barry. Hello. Another one is called L-I-M-E-G-O-L-D, Limey Gold. <laughs> and they were just, you know, giving the nasty gesture to the British. They had so little respect for them. The British had draconian laws of money laundering, but it didn't cover your lawyer. So they sent these bags of millions of dollars and electronic funds through the lawyer through the National Bank of Scotland. Billions. Finally, British intelligence shut him down and said, you're connected to Semyon Miguelovich. You can't play here anymore. They told the Canadians. They ignored it. The Americans finally, in 1998, in August, attacked the headquarters in Newtown, Pennsylvania, run by a man named Jacob Bogotan, who used to be a scientist working in a secret weapons facility before the Soviet Union fell in. And he was the head of the corporation. And as you see, he had a couple of investment firms underneath that as well. So the INS and the Customs and the IRS and the FBI shut them down. And only then did they stop trading this on the Toronto stock market. But prior to that, these folks had taken their inflated money, dollars, and bought stock in pension funds and mutual funds in Canada. Ooh, you're starting to eat into bedrock stuff with inflatable money. That can be dangerous. How does this affect us in terms of the internet? How does this affect us in terms of computer security? Now, these people were involved in something that was reported in the Washington Times about three and a half years ago by Arno Borgrav, a member of that uh, CSIS organization. Some computer, it wasn't a hacker, it was too sophisticated, penetrator had gotten into American companies to the tune of, we're talking secrets, we're talking money, in two months, $300 million. The Secret Service started tracking them, you know how that's done, you know, in the middle of the night, they're coming in through time, you know, da -da -da -da, they go through and they finally find it's coming from, oh, it's going through Vienna, right? They get, oh, it's coming from Russia. As they get closer to the Russian source, they run into some encryption, and they get through the encryption, and now they're probing the source. They're interrogating the actual system that is the perpetrating system. What they didn't know, they had an automatic audit trail in there with an alarm on it. It wasn't long after they started this probing that a virus was fired back and took out the whole Secret Service system. <laughs> Hello. This, so I tell people when I give the talk on computer security and information security in the, uh, in the same museum that if you don't have a defensive capability with an automatic auto trail system and alarm and an offensive capability to fire back a cyber weapon at your adversary, you're not quite as good 
as the Russian Mafia. How are they connected with terrorism? What did I say? They're shipping what? Weapons? Semyon Mikhailovich arranged for buying up nuclear material, weapons technology from far away from Moscow, where everybody's starving to death, they'll sell anything, and shipping it down to Iraq, Iran, Syria, and Libya. One of these characters and it works for the Russian Mafia, was prominent in the papers as a very flamboyant personality. His name was Tarzan. Ludwig Feinberg. He's got a nice picture with Vyacheslav Ivanko, as did one of the uh, White House vis visitors, a man named Lochowski, Vyacheslav Ivanko. Um, Tarzan owned a, a large entertainment complex called Porky's, you can imagine what kind of entertainment. And it was a watering hole for the Russian Mafia in Miami. They finally got a man inside, the DES got, or the FBI got a man inside, a Russian, and found out what this guy was really into. He was brokering multi-ton shipments of cocaine from Colombia into Eastern Europe. And in return, he was brokering multi-ton shipments of weapons, including, I think it was six gunships, helicopter gunships, and some shoulder-fired missiles to the FARC, who now owns 40% of Colombia and is the military arm for the drug dealers. How do these folks all interact? Let's take a look at the next slide. You see a nice picture of Vyacheslav. The Russians have a couple of hundred banks in uh, the Cayman Islands, Sand Kits. Of course, the banks are a terminal, right? And they arrange for electronic funds transfers from Colombian banks and Mexican banks. And as I say, there's a couple of hundred of these, so it's a multi-billion dollar money laundering electronic money laundering operation going on in the Caribbean, and if you're looking for your IMF funds, they're in Cyprus, uh, which they have a, a wonderful uh, superhighway of marvelous ferries going between Israel and Cyprus to the watering hole and the banking facilities of Cyprus. All of these people interact. Semyon Miguelovich has special arrangements with the Chinese and the, uh, the, the, uh, the drug gangs. I'm talking about the Chinese drug gangs and cartels and triads that supply the heroin. What aren't they into? Investment fraud, extortion, drugs, Medicare fraud. Two billion dollars. I like that. They can create all kinds of mobile clinics that check your blood pressure and charge four insurance companies for major operations. Two billion dollars. Real estate, they own some of the finest real estate in the world. A good part of Nice, that's nice. Carlovi Vary, the watering hole, the famous watering hole, right? They're prominent in places like this, gambling casinos, right? How about in our particular area? From Philadelphia, uh, New York, Philadelphia, all the way down, we've finally seen that they're very active. They're the same people, real estate. They own most of the pawn shops in uh, Baltimore County, where they money launder uh, many things. The Ukrainians are stealing cars in Prince George's County. How do they get out of the country? Nobody's been arrested at the port where these cars leave the country, so I don't know what's going on there. Any questions? We have, in addition to Russian organized crime, who's interacting with all these folks, and Oriental organized crime, in my area alone, 12 international mafias. They're alive and well, interacting with each other. They say, if you want to see some really sophisticated security, get down to the Colombian headquarters in Washington, D.C., and look at the cameras and the computers and da-da-da. So, have we got the Russians? Yes. We also have, right here in Las Vegas, the Yaks. Anybody know what that stands for? 
Yugoslavs, Albanians, Croatians, and Serbs. And in the website feeding law enforcement here in Las Vegas, you find out that they're very good at credit card fraud and look after your credit cards. So we have the whole range of East European in our area, and we have the whole range of Oriental uh, mafias, 55,000 Vietnamese, we have a fairly large Vietnamese community. Most of these are wonderful, upstanding people, but some of them are mafia. 175,000 Koreans, most of them are wonderful people, but the Korean mafia is there and has been caught stealing technology and shipping drugs. And the Chinese uh, triads and tongs in the area. The whole South American group, we have Mara Salvatruca, which is an international mafia based in El Salvador, Washington, D.C. It's all across the country. And we have national gangs. I hate, uh, what is the Hells Angels, folks? What is that? It's an online store. That's right. They were trying to pay their way into the seat, a seat on the Toronto stock market. Are they an international corporation? Two and a half years ago, they had wars going on all across Scandinavia with you know, rocket-propelled grenades and AK-47s with rival biker gangs across Scandinavia and in Canada. I talked to an Aussie last week. They're fighting with some biker gang in Australia. A gang? This is not a gang, right? It's a corporation. And they're sophisticated. They're the greatest burners of methamphetamine for years all over the world. We also have our friends from Mexico, the Mexican cartels, who supply most of the cocaine coming up from that area and, and a lot of the marijuana, the Jamaican uh, drug gangs. So what we have is, as I say, 12 international cartels interacting with each other, alive and well and functioning in our region, which runs from southern Pennsylvania right on down through northern Virginia. And they're still functioning. Are they on the internet? Do they have web pages? Some of the larger, quote, big gangs, like the 50,000 member Crips, that's a gang? They're all over the country? Bloods, which are mixed, they're a black and Hispanic and Oriental now, they've expanded. And they have squads going in and taking over towns, particularly outside of Boston and New York. Websites, Latin Kings, they got a website. 10,000 members extending their reach all over the country and in my area. How are we going to fight this? One of the most illuminating things I saw during the riots in Los Angeles was an interview with some Crips. Now you think, oh, gang, gritty, you know, these guys probably look dirty. Uh-uh, man. You look at the, the uniform the quaff of these guys. We're talking $1,500 worth of whatever they have on. Oh, these folks are entrepreneurs. And they're being interviewed and they say, well, you know, do you think this is enough for now? I think you've made your point. Yes, I think so. Well, what happens if you have to organize another demonstration? Oh, well, I'll get on my, uh, on my computer. He says, we have a, a network and we can alert people within 24 hours. This is the Crips. Entrepreneurs. Did you know there was this much of it? This many layers living here, operating successfully. Now, who was it that brought the guns, we're talking terror here, into Los Angeles and took them off the ship and sold them to our most violent street gangs? It was an outfit called Costco, which is a shipping firm owned and operated by the People's Liberation Army. And they were not only offloading, this is all in the newspapers, right? They're offloading AK-47s and arranging for shoulder-fired missiles. Years ago, that would be considered an act of war. That's a form of terrorism. Did they get the uh, contract at Long Beach? No. Oh, good. But they were contending. They were trying to. Yes. And after doing this, they were still in contention.
for a contract at an ex-naval base. Hello? Are we paying attention? The, the um, Chinese communists have declared war on us. They told us this. They basically, you know, we're asymmetrical warfare against the United States. We're going to use information warfare against you. Okay. They told us. They think 30 years in advance. These people think strategically. We know the strategy is what happened yesterday in the stock market. So are we still buying components from these people and putting them in our systems? What's in them? Are they still shipping drugs in and using that as a weapon as they did since 1950 into this country? Did they give or ship arms to your most violent street gangs? This is slow-mo warfare. It's already started, as Richard has said. It's on many layers and many levels. And you and I are on the front line. These organizations are in your neighborhood. Oh no, I live in an upscale neighborhood. Oh really? $250,000 house, oh it's wonderful. You know who was running in the stuff in and out of the house? The Colombians, they don't live poorly. They get some of the most beautiful houses in this country. Arranged for shipments of 18 wheelers through Mexico, the Juarez cartel, which owns a large container ship company that brings in natural gas from Colombia. They are the carrier for Pemex, which is the oil company of Mexico. Only, oops, sometimes those big containers have what in them? Tons of cocaine. They also own railroad companies and build special compartments in the railroads that come into your areas with various kinds of drugs. We're talking about a multi-million dollar, billion dollar corporation. Your methamphetamine comes from another cartel from Mexico called the Amazcua Boys, and they get their raw materials from as far away as Thailand and ship them either as meth or to laboratories throughout the United States, including Kansas City, as components so they can be made there. This is what you're facing. Get on your computers, look at your websites, and you'll find these people advertising. There's a wonderful website on the latest uh, sources and um, prices for drugs. Just, hey, wire us in here, we'll get in touch, and you can go pick it up. What are you going to do about this? How are you aware and fighting against this? These people do technology theft, drugs, weapons. They are your adversaries, and they're living with you. Thank you very much. Okay, we're going to